I'm going to try to respond to the three questions that Kali offered initially to help us frame this discussion. Uh, but as I said, it's a pretty tall order because social ecology does try to create and present a fairly comprehensive perspective which is coherent, that provides a philosophical grounding for the kind of action that we need to take today. And social ecology is very much a praxis. It's not simply a theory. It's put into action, and it's put into action on a variety of levels in a variety of ways. But those actions flow out of a very thought out uh, philosophical basis. And I think that's important because I think there's a tendency, particularly on the left, to embrace action for the sake of action, often without really seriously considering what the impacts of our actions are going to be and what our ultimate goal is. So social ecology really tries to present a framework that we can use to guide our action and to make sure that our action is taking us in the direction that we want to go. Uh, it's a tall order because as a theory, social ecology really begins with an interrogation of, of nature. What is nature? It's an epistemological question. How do we define nature? And for us, that's an essential component of the overall theory. And it begins with an examination of natural evolution, because for social ecology, nature is evolution. Nature is not static. Nature is not what's out there. It's not the trees and the grass. It includes everything. And people are very much a part of nature as well. Uh, but of course, to really look at that framework, we have to go back three and a half billion years. So in the first five minutes of this talk, I will cover three and a half billion years. Uh, and I hope you'll stick with me. Essentially, social ecology says, what is nature? Nature is everything, but we also see gradations in nature. We see, make a distinction between first nature, which is the nature which is non-human, and then second nature, which is nature which is human and which has been affected by human beings. And at this point, when we look around the planet, we have to recognize that every, literally every ecosystem in the world has been affected by human beings. We find mercury in Antarctica. We're finding uh, you know, microplastics in the oceans. We're finding microplastics in our lungs. So humanity has transformed nature in some pretty scary ways. At the same time, we recognize that humanity has the potential to rehabilitate itself and its relationship to nature. And ultimately, social ecology's goal is the reharmonization of people and the natural world. So in order to do that, we look at nature, natural evolution, and we try to extract certain principles which we can use to inform an ethical framework for human action. And that's sort of the second philosophical dimension of social ecology after epistemology or definition is the question of ethics. Uh, obviously, every, since nature is everything, everything is contained within nature. But we know that sort of traditional capitalist renditions of natural history tend to emphasize very Darwinian aspects of evolution. That evolution occurs through competition. It's the battle of each against all each against the other, it's the rule of fang and claw. Social ecology understands nature as having many other aspects as well, which are largely ignored by capitalism, but which need to inform our conception of nature and provide an ethical framework for the politics that will emerge from our understanding of nature. And very briefly, uh, I'll lay out a few of those principles. And I want to emphasize here, too, these are not natural laws. That's a scary route to go down. Hitler talked about natural laws. The social Darwinists talked about natural laws to justify capitalism and imperialism and colonialism. So I won't go that route. But I'll say these are tendencies in nature. And they're tendencies that we need to understand and apply in our actions. First among them is that nature is non-hierarchical. In the natural world, in nature, except within humanity, there is no hierarchy. Hierarchy having a technical definition of being a system of command and control that ultimately has recourse to physical coercion. And it's institutionalized. We don't see that anywhere else in nature. So nature is non-hierarchical. We also see that nature is mutualistic. You know, ecologists used to talk about food chains with the, the predators and the prime predators on top and 
and the prey on the bottom. But in fact, when we consider natural systems now, we recognize that they're a web, that they're interrelated, that they're interdependent, that in fact the lion is not the king of beasts. The lion is dependent on the prey, and the prey are dependent on the grasses, and the grasses are dependent on the microbes in the soil, and it's all connected. We have to recognize that. That's something that indigenous people have known forever, but modern humanity has gotten away from that, and capitalism has reinforced all of those divisions and splits. So we see nature is non-hierarchical, nature is mutualistic. Within nature, there is unity in diversity. And this is an extremely important point, and I think an extremely important ethical principle for us to understand and put forward. In natural systems, in ecosystems, the greater the number of species interrelating, the more stable the system. And that kind of unity, which is the hallmark of natural systems, the holism, the interdependence, is only enhanced by diversity. And in fact, when you simplify an ecosystem, when you start extracting species and you reduce it to a very few species, it's an extremely vulnerable system and those ecosystems collapse. And that's what monoculture is. It's a simplification of nature. Monoculture in an agricultural sense and monoculture in a political and cultural sense as well. So we really need to recognize that. Another very important principle that social ecology extracts from its understanding of nature is that within natural evolution, and I'm not suggesting it's a steady increase, but there is, over time, over millennia, over centuries, there is a steady movement towards ever greater diversity, complexity, and degrees of freedom. And we see that. Freedom being defined as the development of will, the development of the ability to make choices, and that's clearly the directionality of nature. And once again, I'm simplifying I'm three and a half billion years in five minutes or less. But, but these are principles that I'm putting forward, not simply because they're a, a clever intellectual construct, but because they inform our understanding and our actions. Another very important principle is that nature, natural world, natural evolution is homeostatic. It's not static, it's not unchanging, it's constantly in flux, there's death, there's growth, there's birth, there's decomposition. These are all part of natural cycles, all necessary parts of natural cycles. But throughout all of those changes, a healthy ecosystem maintains a dynamic balance. And that's what homeostasis is. It's a dynamic balance. And we also see within the rest of nature uh, that spontaneity plays a very important role. That in fact, the kinds of mutations that lead to new species developing and species developing new traits is very much a spontaneous, seemingly spontaneous process. And it allows us then to adapt to changing conditions. So these are some basic principles that we work with. Then the third philosophical level at which social ecology operates, and is someone keeping time here? Okay, can you, you let me know? You're good. All right. Uh, an another very Im important aspect, probably for us here, gathered here, the most important philosophical aspect of social ecology is the politics. And once again, in an attempt to create a coherent perspective, the politics of social ecology flow out of the ethics, so that the politics are politics which are non-hierarchical, which are mutualistic, which respect and celebrate unity and diversity, which ask us to move towards an ever more complex and diverse and free world. And in that process, ask us to maintain a degree of homeostasis and to allow for spontaneous development. And that translates politically into a very clear political program, a program which is decentralized, which is non-hierarchical, which is based in direct democracy, which is based in the principle of unity and diversity. And I'll get into that in a little more specifics a little later. Uh, now, the second question that Kali posed was, how does this form of socialism differ from previous forms of socialism? And I think there are some important lessons that we can learn by examining that. The first thing I would say is that uh, when we look at traditional forms of socialism, at least Marxist socialism, I, I think there are three main distinctions between 
the perspective of social ecology and traditional socialism. The first revolves around what constitutes the revolutionary subject. Who constitutes the revolutionary subject? Certainly in traditional Marxism, it is the proletariat, and specifically the industrial proletariat. And the point of organizing and the point of revolutionary activity is within that space. Uh, you know, Marx talked about how the industrial process helps to create the conditions for a proletariat which will be an industrial army. It disciplines people, it teaches them how to respond. It's a process which really takes people who have been uh, in a much more amorphous kind of state and relationship and it, and it structures them in a way which can then be mobilized in the process of social transformation. Well, social ecology certainly accepts that the proletariat, that workers have a role to play. Though personally, I have to say, as far as the white working class in America goes today, I, I've really begun seriously to question their revolutionary potential since they've been so inculcated and enculturated in white supremacy and the kinds of attitudes are reflected in their politics. Uh, I haven't given up on them entirely, but I do recognize that there is another working class out there which consists primarily of people who've been marginalized by capitalism, and they certainly represent part of that revolutionary subject. But social ecology also embraces other classes and other types of organizational forms that people are placed within, so that we recognize the important role that farmers have to play. You know, Marx really was quite contemptuous of the peasantry of people who worked the land, didn't see them as having a great deal of revolutionary potential at all, Ex in, with the exception of the Russian peasantry, who in his famous letter to Buras Vasulovich, he said, you know, that the, the Russian mere, the peasant commune, could be transformed. Okay. Only after five drafts. Right, he granted them that. Uh, so, but we embrace farmers, we think they're an important part of it. Also, artists. We need art, we need cultural workers. They're a, a vital part of any revolutionary process and have to constitute, a, if not a vanguard, that they, they have a crucial role to play in social transformation. And we've seen that again and again and again, how artists, writers, are able to pinpoint the pressure points in society and present a vision of something comprehensively different from what exists today. And we also, in social ecology, think there's a role for uh, petty bourgeois, you know? Okay. Shopkeepers, smallholders, the professional class, they also have revolutionary potential. And we even embrace the lumpen proletariat, uh, who Marx referred to as the altersheists, the old shits, street people, people coming out of street gangs, people coming out of prison, people coming out of various kinds of backgrounds who have been tossed on the trash heap of our society. We see them as well as having tremendous revolutionary potential. So that's the main difference, one of the main differences between traditional forms of socialism and the kind of socialism social ecology advocates. The second difference has to do with the form that the revolutionary organization takes. Of course, for traditional Marxists, it is a centralized party that operates through democratic centralism, a hierarchical system of command and control that ultimately has recourse to physical coercion. We reject that. We say we don't need that kind of revolutionary organization. What we need instead is a confederation of locally based organizations that operate through direct democracy. And they should be based in community. Very important very important. And then the third major difference has to do with the role of the state, where of course Marx called for a socialist revolution in which the proletariat would seize control of the state, and then somehow magically the state is supposed to wither away. But we've seen certainly historically that just the opposite happens, that when a hierarchically organized party seizes control of a state rather than withering away, it reinforces its own control and certainly historically has become authoritarian. So we don't believe in state power, we believe in decentralized community power based in communities. And this is very important too because the locus of organizing for social ecology is community. And that means not, not 
you know, simply the virtual communities that exist online, but communities where you live, so that you have to go out and you have to connect with your neighbors. And the kind of revolution that we envision is one which is really based in primary ties, face-to-face -face relationships between people. And I can tell you from experience that this model, while it may sound a little pie in the sky to folks, actually works. We have a functioning system of town meeting direct democracy here in Vermont. Every year we gather together as a town, as a community, and we make the decisions that will directly affect our lives. Here in Marshfield, I've seen people from very different political outlooks and political persuasions come together to discuss and debate in a civil way and to make decisions for the town. And it works. And I've seen it not just happen in little rural Vermont, but I've seen it happen in New York City, where I worked for 12 years on New York's Lower East Side in the Hispanic community there called Lower East Side, where people held quarterly town meetings. This was a neighborhood with a population of 30,000 people. And we'd have 500 people, representatives from the over 100 community organizations that existed in that community, and individuals come together to make decisions for their community. And those decisions were often very different from the decisions that were being made by the city bureaucrats and the city government. And then we would take our vision, take it to the people, and begin to contest with the official over exactly whose vision was going to be implemented. And this happened a lot around issues of planning. Uh, and I can talk about that. I could go on about all of this for days, but clearly I only have a few more minutes left. So I'm going to conclude simply by suggesting to you the political program that social ecology puts forward, which is really pretty basic and very much what I think people here are already doing. It begins uh, really with oppositional politics. We need to continue to oppose those who exist. Uh, you know, Bakunin used to say, I will remain an impossible person as long as those who are possible remain possible. Uh, so we have to be impossible people. We have to say those who are possible cannot remain possible. And very specifically, we have to protest. We have to say, no, you can't build that pipeline. No, you can't build that nuclear power plant. No, you can't cut that program. No, you can't prevent women from having abortion. No, you can't discriminate against gay and trans people. All of that is vitally important. Necessary, necessary, but not sufficient. We have to move beyond protest, and we need to create alternatives. And this often takes the form of community development, which means developing relationships in your community and very importantly, creating alternative institutions. We can't be afraid to institutionalize what we do and what we know is right. But the form that that institutionalization takes has to reflect our ethical principles. It has to be non-hierarchical, it has to be directly democratic, it has to be mutualistic. This is the kind of very important work that Cooperation Jackson has been doing, the kind of work that we did on the Lower East Side, which I'd love to have a chance to tell you more about. Um, so that creation of alternatives and alternative institutions is vitally important. And that will begin to provide both a material base for our new society and a set of experiences which will help to educate people in the practice of democracy and in the practice of mutual aid, because these are things which have largely gone by the wayside in the existing society. And then the third level at which we have to move forward is the level of politics, and we have to engage politically. But we need to also redefine politics. Politics cannot remain statecraft. It's not just going and pulling a lever, voting for a Democrat. You know, I mean, I have to admit, I vote for Bernie Sanders. I'm a Vermonter, and I'd much rather have Bernie Sanders in the Senate than Ted Cruz. But I also recognize the limitations of that kind of politics. And we need to create an alternative politics that can begin to contest with the existing politics for power. And the way we do that is by creating town meetings, neighborhood assemblies, and this can happen at any scale. And then we need to create networks and confederations of those alternative political entities. And I'll close simply by saying another aspect of social ecology that I would emphasize is that we are utopian. And I say that proudly. Uh, the word is a word which has been 
bandied about in terrible ways. It's been redefined, it's used as a pejorative. Oh, that's utopian, that can never happen. But if you know anything of the entomology of the word, it was coined in 1515 by Sir Thomas More. He said there were two roots, both from ancient Greek, autopia, which means no place, and utopia, which means the good place. And it's the good place that we need to move towards, and we need to articulate our vision of that good place. We need to paint a picture of what our utopia would look like, and that will serve both to attract people, to give us a sense of inspiration, to help us move forward in our struggles, and it also has as a checkpoint so that as we take the incremental steps that are moving us from where we are now to where we want to be, we're able to refer back to that vision and see if we're actually moving in the right direction. So. I'll close with that. Thank you very much.